ever wonder how someone turns a cool idea into a documentary film? Or maybe you just love the genre. Either way, you're in the right place. I'm an award-winning documentary director and editor. Each episode, I sit down with other doc filmmakers and talk shop in this limited series monthly podcast. This is Handheld with Dan Napoli. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Handheld with Dan Napoli. I'm super stoked about our guest today, uh, Ben Berman. His most recent film or films uh, have seen the light of day in the last month-ish. It is the two-part, or I should say two documentaries, two parts, depending on how you want to frame it. Um, and the ESPN 30 for 30 series, the American Gladiators documentary. Ben, dude, thank you so much for taking a minute and, and visiting. Thank you. Um, I think it's definitely one doc, two parts. Yeah. Even though what you might be alluding to is the second part kind of um, becomes something a little bit uh fresher or slightly different. It grows. We'll just say that it grows. Yeah. From part one. But um, yeah, ESPN 30 for 30 would be uh, upset if we said, oh, it's just it's two different films. It's one really long one that changes. (laughs) Who knows? I mean, it's hard because it's always weird. Like it's just the bizarre world we live in. Like you have to go find it in like if you go on iTunes, like all the 30 for 30s are in as a TV show. Like yeah. they're in the there, so it's the like so. I was like, I don't know, maybe if they want it as a series, but no, it was it was definitely two parts, dude. I so good. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, so much, um, so much to talk about. Um, but but I think we'll start right there. Um, I mean, fuck it, it's a podcast, so we don't have to be like linear. Um, I think I jokingly said an email. I was like, oh man. Oh, I don't know if I can ever use narration again and not feel like a hack um, without mm. without too much of of, of uh, spoiler. Um, kind of what what Ben's alluding to. If you haven't seen it, there's there's a lot of different stuff going on. But in the second, in part two, at the um, behest request, as it's it's framed of, as as uh, the main subject, um, there's an illusion to use narrate uh, uh, to use a narrator and probably for it feels like a third of it maybe more there there is one so i want to start there um i felt it in a very certain way i don't want to like you know color in somebody's song lyrics but please tell us about um that choice that you guys made um and, and the way that you chose to use narration cuz that was so unique Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, there's this device um, in the doc that uh, the protagonist, the main protagonist, this guy, Johnny Ferraro, who is the co-creator of American Gladiators. Um, he, you know, significantly controlling individual who had his ideas of how this doc should be made and the story that should be told, which is uh, significantly different than the full story. And, you know, our choices, the film team's choices of how to make this documentary. So, yeah, there's this device where, like, he'll uh, request something or deny, like, I don't want to film at my house. I want to, you know, um, let's just film in a soundstage. So then you see us filming in a soundstage. And then in the beginning of part two, he's like, hey, I was thinking like maybe we could have a narrator that tells the story. He was clearly thinking a nar- a narrator that that tells his story. And, um, you know, uh, a, a, yeah, how do I say it? a narrator? Like, you know, that he had a certain vision in mind when he requested that. But I basically say yes to that. Sorry, Lenny. Uh, we love second. dogs on this show, dude. No worries. The Amazon guy just dropped off a book, so. Lenny, come. Um, yeah, so I took it upon myself, ourselves, to play with that, and and you know there are there is a kind of a trope, a cliche in documentaries, kind of more so from the past than than now, of like you know this kind of austere British voice, um, you know, g- giving you this information. Um, but in reality, it was more a play on this specific filmmaker, Nick Broomfield. Are you familiar with Nick Broomfield? Oh, God, I'm not sure I am. Documentarian, British documentarian, very uh, 
um, somewhat famous uh, documentarian who does who do who does these kind of small. I would want to kind of say pop culture docs, but he's in them. He's the sound guy. He's like knocking on doors, barging into businesses, trying to get answers. And he, he's he got a boom pole. He's his own sound guy. And then he does, you know, narration to his own movies. I tried to clearly you see me in part two with a Absolutely. I literally just stole his gag. His or no, it's not his gag. His thing, his identity <laughs> as a filmmaker, I just totally stole outright. Um, and then I wanted him to do the voiceover for for my movie, but he he ultimately didn't get back to me at that point. So uh, sorry to ramble, but yeah, no, British no, it voiceover. felt super PBS though. That was my like where my brain went to like like it's like my my dad scrolling through or flicking through as a kid that old school kind of like some of those docs that you would find on, a, it felt very PBS and that like proper, you know, for, for a half a second, I'm like, is that Sir Anthony Hopkins? Wait, what's going on here? Um, or no, it's not Sir Ant. Oh, you didn't think Anthony Hopkins. You thought Attenborough, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, Neither. Yeah, that was, um, you be paid. <laughs> but yeah, dude, that, that was, that was a very, um, and so I, that that plays off two things that I want to ask you about. Um, one that we talked talked about before we started rolling, um, and then you know you just mentioned um, you know your 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 protagonist, um, kind of a two parter here, but um, not just for that narration gag, if we'll call it that, but for, for the whole whole part. How much did your background in working in comedy? Um, cause that's what some of your background is as, as a filmmaker did like, like play into this combined with the fact that like you have a, a protagonist, a subject, a character, depending on which terminology one likes to use that was very controlling or, or wanted to have a very involved, be very involved. It appeared. Um, well, yeah, uh, my my background is in comedy television for the most part. I started, um, you know, as a PA, but but very quickly kind of got into editing, comedy editing, um, in a in a very specific way, working with the comedians Tim and Eric and the editing um, on their show, which was called Tim and Eric Awesome Show. Great job on Adult Swim uh, was very um, idiosyncratic and was basically kind of a form of writing via stylized weird editing. So that's where I got my start. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, and it's basically like a form of directing in a, in, in, in and of itself. So yeah, I, there's no question that my background in comedy and my specific history with it, um, an experience with it uh, form, you know, formulates where I where I am as a director in 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 comedy and and in documentary filmmaking. Funny, my I, I, I my first documentary, which is called the Amazing Jonathan documentary, um, somewhat similar but pretty different, but kind of similar worlds. Um, I was at a film festival in Sheffield in in England. In the UK and uh, we just premiered there and someone came up to me after and was like, um, you made like a funny documentary. Like, how do you feel about that? Like, almost like, like, it just doesn't happen often. Um, and she was almost like, like, are you how, like, are you do you know that? Like, are you OK with the fact that you made a funny documentary? Like, you know, like kind of judging me or something on it. Um, and I was like, no, I feel great about it. Like what, like I would have never questioned not to make a documentary that has humor in it. So like yeah, I think the genre maybe, yeah, something like that. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I can't speak to the specifics, but yeah, of course, like it's who I am. It's, it's, I think anything that I make will, uh, have humorous moments and levity to it and also have really hopefully heartbreaking and very humanistic, sad things, uh, and, and balancing 
those worlds seamlessly is is kind of so far one of the identity makers of of me as a filmmaker i think so did that help you like because i i you know i'm curious even i put myself in those shoes of like how i would have handled or or anybody would handle the interactions with with johnny and you having this humor background and and specifically like idiosyncratic more absurd or or even you know I wonder how much that played into it or or even you just taking the film because on on some level the concept of American gladiators is kind of ridiculous right like yeah totally no uh um like I I definitely didn't sign up for this project to to do a a straight up doc on American gladiators um it it is what one might perceive as like not important (laughs) um or or I wouldn't say not interesting. It's very interesting, but I didn't just want to do a straight up nostalgia doc. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, you you watch the doc and it, it, yeah, it is about American gladiators, but it's, I think it's about so much more. Um, you know, I won't identify those things for, for the viewers, but I, I think there's, there's much more than just the history of American gladiators. Sorry. What was your question? I kind of think I might've, Gone off course. So. Oh, no, no, dude. That's absolutely part of it because um, it was a ridiculously multi-layered pact. You hit three of the four. I was just kind of curious, too. I was like, did did your humor background help you basically sort of work work with or like how much did it inform Respond how you managed Johnny? Johnny? Yeah. Yeah. Well, good question. I, 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 I think a not just Johnny, but, but overall, you know, um, my history of having a a comedy background, of course, you know, uh, helped to service this, this documentary, like anything, any short little film that I do or any big narrative feature that I've yet to do, my background in comedy or my comedic instincts will be a part of that more than likely. I don't think I'll ever make a dark drama that isn't kind of funny in places. Um, specifically with Johnny, you know, how I, I don't make a doc uh, that deals with Johnny Ferraro and do it in a completely sincere way that bows down to him. Like he, he clearly does have a little bit of a kind of a God complex and in order to, you know, get across what he wants to get across. Well, what am I trying to say? Yeah. I, there, there's, there's no way, there's no other way I, I could have done it or I should have done it. Yeah. There are funny moments in there with Johnny that kind of to some degree slightly undercut his impression of himself that he wants to give to the viewer. Right. Absolutely. And I also, I think the most, the more, more interestingly is how Johnny is like, um, you know, he has a very specific narrative that he wants to present through this documentary, but I don't think he, he or many people expect that some of the behind the scenes negotiations and business, whatever be a part of the actual story for some reason which kind of makes sense a lot of people think that there's a big difference between what's what the film is and what the conversations about what the film is like the fact that those are different but i'm saying no it's all the same to have some behind the scenes negotiations of like what we should do what we shouldn't do how we should do it or who Johnny wants in the movie, who Johnny doesn't want in the movie. It's all extremely telling to who a subject is and what their wants and desires are and maybe what their fears are without them even knowing that they're communicating that. So the stuff that happens off screen is as valuable, if not more valuable than what happens on screen when the person knows they're on, they're on. Oh, a million percent. And so if you haven't, if you're, if you're listening or watching this and haven't seen it, pause this, go watch both of those. And then you can come find us later. 
Um, but you definitely have to have to see both parts of it. And again, without like spoiling or, or telling too much anything, but like very much so, um, which is something I loved about it and I thought was super well done is it really is this like panoramic, like there's very little separation, like the process of making this movie, not in a, um, I mean, I never f- thought of it as like self-serving for you guys as, you know, the, the, the creatives, um, to steal another wrestling parlance term, which I know is later in some there, there somewhere, but, uh, it's never you guys putting yourselves over, but it really did tell the full scope of like what this whole process, um, was like. And I do think a lot of times, I mean, again, I think of some of my own experience there's, uh, for whatever reason, a like, don't show how the sausage is made right? Like, let's put this over aside here and like, oh, maybe we'll do like a little 10 minute behind the scenes and blah, 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 blah. But like this fully leans in on um, the whole process, which is, you know, if you have a cantankerous, potentially God complex um, protagonist, there are going to be phone calls where, right, where they were like, I don't want this in. I don't want you to do, hey, are we doing this? I don't, you know, and so I thought including many, many moments of that and some, some different things, um, really gave the piece, um, or pieces like, um, a really interesting bent. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm not the first person to do that, but like, I guess I, I wasn't even aware of Nick Broomfield's work very like overtly when I even made the Jonathan doc. Um, but I, 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 I saw, he did a doc, I think called Kurt and Courtney about Kurt Cobain and Courtney love potentially killing Kurt and whatever. Um, but there's a moment in that doc where he's like, so this is the point, this is a point where, uh, I, I play a Nirvana song, but Courtney love owns the masters or whatever. So, um, we just had to get the sound alike. And then he plays the sound alike in the scene as like he's driving like that's that shit is just great because a and least importantly, it's funny. It creates a laugh and it's sure it's about the process of documentary filmmaking, but I don't read it like that. It's just it's just like it's just it's just a laugh. It's just funny. But more importantly, um, yeah, it tells the story more fully right. than than it would have if if they didn't do that. If they just played the sound alike or whatever, like you, you get, I don't know. There's 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 more to it. There's more storytelling. I think it's more impactful. Dynamics. I think it's more impactful than if you had like if you had a talking head saying right like Courtney I know now we're talking about a different the blah blah blah. Right, yeah. Courtney's very yeah. difficult about issuing masters. Yeah, like show don't tell. Kurtz. It's it, right. It's it's pretty much show don't tell. That's that's that maybe that's the core of of all this is it's way better to show something than to just tell someone the thing. So all these things, all any be slightly behind the scenes thing or whatever is indeed showing the viewer, you know to some degree who Johnny is or what his desires are or wants are or fears are or whatever versus just, you know, hearing it from some, from someone. So yeah, I, I, that's, that's, I think why it works best maybe. And I think, dude, that's a, that's a great way to articulate it because I think that also like helps me like rephrase every time you guys do it, it's in service of the story. It's not in service of yourselves to be like, oh, look at the filmmakers. It is like telling you something about the character or the people or or the process. But as it relates to the, you know, over overarching story you're trying to tell. Um, And I, you know, that was cool. I really, really appreciated seeing that. Thank you. Yeah, Um, I think I think I think I'm going to retire some some elements some things that are somewhat that I that uh, that were done in the Jonathan doc and in the Gladiators doc, like these phone calls, like pausing the scenes, um, and and overall the search for truth, like having a 
unreliable narrator or difficult protagonist or whatever that might not be telling the full truth and me trying to get to the bottom of what's real, what's not. I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> um, I'd like to I'd like to continue making docs and I, I, I I'm, I'm sure I will. Um, but in a I'm excited to see what I'm going to do next. That's not going to be so similar to these two, first two docs. So uh, talk a little bit. How did how did this dot get on your radar? And did you always know from from the outset it was going to be a 30 for 30? Or uh, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Sure. Um, right. I believe right before the pandemic, uh, this guy, Danny Gabay uh, at Vice Studios reached out to me and basically said, hey, us at Vice, we're thinking about maybe doing a doc on American Gladiators. And I said, oh, I remember that from when I was a kid. I used to watch it with my brother and stuff. And, um, uh, you know, but I don't want to do just a straight up nostalgia doc. Let me look into it, see if there's a real story there, see if there's something I could do with it. Um, But uh, yeah, so I started researching into it, just Googling and just fucking around on on the Internet. Um, And very quickly, I was able to identify a couple things that I was like, Oh, maybe that's my way in. Maybe I, I could do something actually kind of smart with this where, I, like I, I was kind of saying before, I think the subject matter of the American gladiators is not a subject that seems very intelligent or super interesting. It's just, oh, remember this from the past. But yeah, I found some of the allusions to some of the creator drama and once i found out that there was kind of some native american theme involved in that it totally triggered for me it was like oh i think we could do something smart here to some degree telling the history of american gladiators but almost as a microcosm for the history of america and how certain people steal other people's property and etc and and exploitation of workers and all that juicy shit but funny enough yeah. i was on letterbox um yesterday looking through some of the comments and someone was like and i get it and they're not wrong they're like dude american gladiators like i don't need someone to do like connect the history of american gladiators to like bigger the history of america or anything like just give me the fucking doc on american gladiators and i understand but that's don't don't come to a Ben Berman doc um, thinking that it's just going to be a doc on American Gladiators. That's kind of what I I'm proud of. <laughs> well, yeah, but dude, I don't. I mean, it's not like I'm an American Gladiators aficionado, but I don't think I think that is a huge yeah. challenge for doc makers. Um, and uh, like. I think you guys, again, not an aficionado, but I think you guys did a nice job of threading the needle because I think the challenge is when you tell the story from a subculture and so there is a, or a fan base or whatever you want to call it. So there are people that are clamored for the thing, right? Is how do we make something that is the story we want to tell, right? That, that services that audience, if you will, that they can check that box but we also feel good about making and potentially like the broader, uh, right? Because there's, there's a flip side to be like, I didn't give a shit about American Gladiators. I'm not going to watch. Why would I watch a documentary on this? And you're like, that's, no, 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 dude. That's, more, that's where I'm at. That's like, I, 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 I'm making something. If you're a super fan of the thing, you're going to not like, you're more than, more than likely you're not going to like my version of the doc on it, right? But funny enough, in both the Jonathan doc and now in the Gladiators doc, there are other there are competing projects that are, you know, with the Jonathan doc, certainly more normal, more straightforward. Um, There is a a Netflix later this month is releasing an American Gladiators documentary um, that has a bunch of the other Gladiators in it. Um, It's like a six part, five part, six part doc series. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing it. You know, comparing and contrasting, and I couldn't imagine it'll be anything like ours. So 
Oh, I'm sure it's super different. So that will be, um, again, hopefully this doesn't come into a, a, a spoiler category, but as what happens with a lot of these things, there were folks that did not want to participate in this project. Yeah. Um, are they participating to your knowledge in the, in the Netflix piece? Uh, a lot of them are. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The, yeah I wonder I mean, if the, the slant will be different. Well, I, I, I'm pretty confident it won't cover the creator, Johnny Ferraro, Dan Carr stuff. I'm sure Johnny will be mentioned and I'm sure it'll be a negative in, in a portrayal. <laughs> um, uh, I wonder if any of the if Dan Carr will even be mentioned once, which is interesting. But I think that that one is more than likely going to be really just like stories from the gladiators about the show and about their trauma and drama. And, you know, I, I think it's I'd like to be proven wrong to some degree, but I, I would imagine it's a bit more straightforward and and the expected thing. Dude, this was, a, and sorry, before I forget, I actually just, the reason I brought up the cats that didn't participate was at what point of your guys' filmmaking process, like, are you in pre-pro? Like, do you find out that you're like, oh, by the way, here's a slab of stars yeah. you probably remember. They they ain't doing this. And it actually goes to your previous question that we didn't finish. So um, I was able to... Uh, Danny Goodbye from Vice reaches out to me. I look into the subject matter of American Gladiators. I find only a couple things that I'm like, oh, maybe this could be the re like, you know, what the, my angle or what I what intrigues me about it. And then we um, Vice and me film uh, for four or five days with Johnny, the creator, with Ice, with a number of the Gladiators. Um, and uh, um, I cut together, you know, a, a teaser trailer sales material thing. We go out, we pitch to all the networks. Um, ESPN uh, is is interested in doing it. We go with ESPN 30 for 30. So so a, a, on the outset, it wasn't like this is going to be a 30 for 30 ESPN doc. It could have it could have ended up at Netflix or Max or fucking Amazon, whatever. Um but super, super happy it worked out. Uh, and we we ended up doing it with ESPN and uh, 30 for 30. They were really, really great partners. They gave us money. They went away for a long time. Never asked us like, like what are we doing? Or where, what, like, never asked us to see anything. And then I was like, like deep into it, we had cut together like some scenes and stuff. I was like, these are good scenes. I feel like because they've been so nice, we should like send them four or five of these great little pod scenes just to tell them and show them like we're we're doing good here so we do any which way um but when did we find out that we weren't going to have access to like a lot of the gladiators um it was very early on so we 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 sold it to ESPN and Vice is going back to the people the gladiators that we interviewed for the teaser and that's Malibu Saber, Ice, Tower. I forget who else. A few others, maybe. Um, Gemini, maybe? Did you have him yet? No, we didn't do Gemini for the teaser. We we got him wow, later. Okay. Thank God we got him later. Um, anyway, and then as Vice is going back, after we sold it to ESPN, Vice is going back to like negotiate actual deals for the actual project. And that's when they, they found out. They're like, yeah, so Ice, or talk to Ice's lawyer. So yeah, we're ready to do her deal. And, and they're like, oh, she's no longer available. She's going with the other American Gladiators doc. And we're like, what the fuck? So there was a moment of clamoring, like, okay, fight. You have to fight for your glads. Like, I'm going to call Tower. I'm going to, you know, appeal to Ice and try to get them to come aboard ours. And, it, you know, it was, it was a mess. Um, oh, that's wild, but, dude. And I'm so over this, too, to some degree. But you can never be over it because it's a good philosophy. But um, whenever there's a problem, when there, whenever there's an obstacle, you can uh, often decide, like, is are you going to see it for being a problem and you're going to try to, like, solve the problem or go around the problem or whatever? Or can you embrace the problem? It's the same thing as, like, those phone calls with Johnny or the negotiations right. behind the scenes. 
it might it be better to utilize that to your advantage to show the viewer and to reflect a character or a subject or the story at hand. Um, so as you see in part one of, of our doc, we end up very clearly, I think, communicating to the viewer, well, what? Why don't we? Why haven't you seen Nitro and Ice and Tower and Laser and whoever else um, in this doc? Uh, and it's because, and then we own up to the fact, we own the fact that this is what happened. That that they didn't want to do this doc mainly, seemingly because uh, of Johnny. John, they like John. If this is Johnny's doc, like go fuck Johnny. We're gonna go do this other one. But dude, to your point earlier about show don't tell, right? Again, like what's what's a better illustration that the business side of this is 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 contentious and potentially and viewed by some as exploitive, and then the fact that like people will not participate because of some people who are participating. Like again, that's a, a, a kind of a fantastic. Um, so it was kind of funny too, because like I said, I'm not a obviously watched it like everybody that was, but I didn't realize how many people like keyed, like because you had Malibu and the hair, he kind of looks like Adam Warlock from Marvel. And I'm like, okay, I kind of remember it wasn't until the hit list comes and I'm like, oh wow, they are missing a lot of people that I kind of would have remembered. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my knowledge or my experience of American gladiators, I definitely remember Malibu um, but you know, Nitro and Ice were like the the main gladiators from from my childhood. Um, I don't think like you know, I I interviewed Lori, who's Ice, for the teaser, and like I don't know, there's a I I believe I absolutely believe, and I'm not just saying this because it's who we we got, but I believe we got the the best gladiators, like the, the, the kind gladiators, the gladiators that actually have real sincerity and real thoughts and real humanity and real ex life experiences and don't still to this day, you know, just think of themselves and their lives in terms of what they were 30 years ago. Like Malibu is an incredible, Darren McBee is an incredible person so um, undeniably dynamic and warm and endearing and has an incredible story, life story ahead of gladiators, during gladiators and after gladiators, stuff that'll really, you know, te te bring tears to your eyes as well and bring you hope. Saber is an incredible, uh, uh, Red Williams played Saber, incredible guy, found, found religion, was a gang member, like, and just like, I love that guy. Me and him are, he's a, I don't know what he is religiously. I think it's a black Israelite, but I don't know. So I'm Jewish. So we have some, we're kind of brothers. It's great. I love him. Um, I wondered a little bit. I, it hit his part because I'm like, okay, that's, I'm, I, I don't believe that's Islam, but I'm not sure what he's doing exactly. Not like, it's Islam. very interesting. I asked him once, um, like, so what, what's your religion? And I think he answered, I am, I'm Israel. I am, is, I am Israel. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I think it's black Israelite, but um, he, he's he's cool, man. But dude, that so and, and that's then, and really Gem, sorry. And Gemini's fantastic, has an oh, incredibly totally. endearing uh, and and heart wrenching story. The fact that like you know this older man who 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 is still so strong, like tears up about his family, is amazing. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh no 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 not at all. I was I was um I was just gonna say I think. I think there's a really good lesson to be learned there from for for filmmakers though and especially sports related stuff and you know I've kind of experienced that too is like sometimes the guy sometimes the guy who is like the 13 time all-star and like the 680 hitter is a terrible interview. You know right. what I mean? Like they're not necessarily they don't give you everything like you really need to have as much as they're so, so kind of coming off your point where you feel like, hey, I really feel like we did have the, the, the best gladiators. You might have missed out on some folks that had the higher name um, notoriety, 
But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I hate to use the word performance because it's, you know, it's a doc and it's scripted, but, but you might not have gotten that stuff out of, out of those folks. And then, you know, so it's, it's not always the guy on the all-star roster that is going to be your bread and butter, right? I think it's about, first of all, I don't care about the best. I rarely want to tell stories about the best of the best. Who gives a fuck? Uh, how about an underdog? How about someone who's kind of great, but kind of flawed? And like, I do not care about, um, you know, larger than life superheroes that were blah, blah, blah. like, no one gives a fuck. I don't care about American gladiators. I'll say it. <laughs> I care about humanity and I care about, uh, subjects that, that are dynamic, um, in a dynamic story. So yeah. Uh, yeah whatever <laughs> um, no but there is something, something else that was kind of interesting uh, sorry um oh no man You're well my question so so how did you come upon the american gladiator stock not necessarily a big aficionado of of the prod of of gladiators but you're you're a sports fan and um dude i i am uh, but um i came about it like uh what one of my best friends who's like um, a retired pro paintball player and is a commentator now and, and has narrated a bunch of my docs. Like we're, and as a writer, we're really good friends. And Matt, Matt sent me the trailer and we're the same, you know, he's like two years younger than me. He was like, bro, check here. I was like, Oh my God, this is like, this looks in amazing. And then right. it was so cool because from the first 20 seconds of it, I was like the trailer of the Oh, no, one. of the actual of part one. I was like, Thanks. oh shit, this is next level. Okay, this is this is Thanks. way different. This is not what like you know, I was fully I mean 30 for 30 has a very, in my opinion, a very hard high bar of very artful sports docs. Um, but this was way um with the way it opened, I was like, okay, this is gonna be way different. I can't wait to like get get plugged into this but yeah you that's how and you're like what's going on this doesn't seem like a sports doc wait why is johnny in space why is he on the lunar yeah. surface but it also I'm is so proud fitting, of the, man. the what it's also so fitting because it's also not purely an athletic competition it's not a a pure sport it it's in you know what american gladiators it it's weirdly in this bizarre like it's not predetermined like pro wrestling but it's not you know the nfl it's in this weird zone and so sports the way you guys chose to right yeah right. sports entertainment less entertainment more real more sports than wwf or something more entertainment than nba nfl whatever and a fucking visual ridiculous spectacle that has a very specific time and place. America, 1989 through 1996. So right. totally. So why not start it with the Big Bang? <laughs> yeah. Um, and Johnny in space and uh, something something fun. I don't know. How? Like, aren't we all kind of tired of of the 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 kind of assembly line version? Copy, copy and paste version of of docs in 2023 and it's going to go on into 2024 and beyond like you watch netflix and it's everything kind of the majority of documentaries look the fucking same feel the same move the same you know there's a handful of people that are documentary filmmakers that are artists that are doing something that are that's different um but uh, it's too much of the same stuff. So I, I wanted us all to shake it up a little bit. And like, you know, we didn't move to LA and we didn't make docs or make stuff to do that. We did it. We want to do it. This. <laughs> how much of your guys's like what ended up being your kind of treatment and your, your, your point of view to it? Like, uh, did you, did you kind of, know you wanted to be that different with it. I know you said, you know, you, you're, all, you're always going to have humor because that's kind of your, your, your voice. You're always going to have a, a different POV. You didn't want to make just a, a regular old American gladiators doc, but like at what point did 
your perspective really start to to crystallize? Did you have to get everything in the can first as you were shooting? Did you start to kind of get your idea? No, I um, no, no. It wasn't. It wasn't just in post that we were defining the style and tone of this doc. Post is extreme. Is basically the main time where you do that. To to be honest, but. Um, I have n no problem. I have not much of a problem having an idea, asserting that idea, and then trying to execute that idea. Yet, you have to remain open to what the thing really is and what it really isn't. But so space, the concept of space and starting in the the Big Bang, I had that early on. And the concept of having voiceover come in in the second half, that was fairly early on as well. There were some ideas, me and my uh, co-director, Kirk Johnson, um, before we even did any interviews other than the teaser, like we spent weeks kind of talking through and hypothetically kind of boarding out the two parts. Um, it completely, so many things changed and moved and whatever, uh, once we got into actual production and post, but having an idea of, okay, it could start like this and then we'll blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, you have to have some sort of starting point. Um, but I, th I think more than other documentarians and other doc post, uh, you know, editors work, I think this is coming from my narrative experience and my comedy experience is you you assert ideas even before you know if they're going to happen or not or if you should make them happen or not. Um, and then you see if you can fulfill those ideas and often you you can. And that's a lot of kind of what you you end up seeing in this finished product and the the tone and the the confidence about something that probably shouldn't be confident comes from early on. Um but yeah, I don't know. I, so, dude, that, that's, okay, that just made me think of something. Let me see if I can phrase this question so it actually makes sense. Um, do you think coming from a comedy is um, there's a really cool quote from 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 Tina Fey from a magazine article with three years ago, which I am now going to butcher because I think she said something like they're called they're called sketches, not concrete, like coming from comedy where you 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 maybe spin out ideas more and 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 it's a process where it's maybe more normal like hey that joke doesn't work we'll change this we'll change that do you think that influences you to be a little bit more open in the process as you're you're creating your doc instead of kind of like you know right down the path i suffer from or struggle with being open I like to plan, execute, deliver. And See, when I have to, like, but, but I'm going to say something and then I'm going to completely contradict it. Okay. Because my God, like, well, I'm, I like, I like to be meticulous. I like to be organized and I, I, I like to be efficient. And anything other than that makes me feel uncomfortable and makes me lose my mind. Yet, at the same time, I'm probably <laughs> like, I don't know if you've seen the amazing Jonathan doc, but so much of that was me responding to what was I was encountering, what was in front of me and then adapting the documentary, the movie to capture that or to whatever, to find that thing. So I've got these um, great. Uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, I, 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 uh, have a multi to multitudes. I contain multitudes. multitudes I'm like this person. type of person. Oh, I want to be, be in the screen. I'm yeah. this type of person far on that spectrum. And then I'm also this person far on this spectrum and somehow they correlate. So yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really, I do struggle a lot with, um, you know, this is my this is the idea I have. Why can't we just execute that idea? Well, we don't have the footage, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, OK, what if I edit it? I, then I can kind of get close, but it's not actually that. But then in me editing it, 
I'll find something new and a way to massage it and work it out. So it's a mess. Docs are a mess. I in the during the process, I um, which was two and a half years of making this thing, I really did struggle mentally and everything. It was a it was a hard, hard process. And um, I was able to uh, get in touch with a, a great documentary filmmaker. His name's RJ Cutler. He's done a bunch of really great high quality stuff. And I had a phone conversation with him and I was telling him like how fucked up I was and like, why is this? Is this going to be OK or whatever? He's like, dude, I guarantee everything's going to be fine. Um, we do crazy things as documentary filmmakers like we'll fire editors, we'll hire someone else, we'll we'll bring back that other editor that we fired. Like it is a process of chaos. Everything's going to be fine. You just have to go through it. And and I guess he was right, <laughs> but um, I think he was. Yeah, I. But I, uh, I also can't do that again. It's too much, too chaotic. It, dude. It it is a thing, man. I was telling somebody the other day. It's a weird, like, and it just sounds so fucking pretentious. But it's like I have to go to a place when I because like I cut all my own stuff. Like, did you cut both of your films? I know um, I, we had we had a lot of really great editors on the Gladiators doc. Um, OK, so many. <laughs> um, but at, I, I'm post is editing is so much more than directing is my identity maker. I, I, I'm not very, I'm not always confident in me as a director, but I'm always very confident in me as an editor. I, I, um, so I was I was a big part of post in, in both projects for sure. So I, I came up similar as like an editor. Like I refer to myself probably in correct order of something like editor, editor writer, producer, director. And sometimes I have to hold a camera if I in those sort of. Um, but no, yeah. I, and I saw that you that you cut The Amazing Johnson because the reason I ask is there's it is a bit of like, man, I got to go. I got to go to this kind of deep, dark place and to get like almost uh, almost emotionally isolated as you go through the process of of cutting this stuff and it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to get yourself to get back in there um like yeah. you know jumping into the the frigid water like you know you can do it you know you're going to be fine once you jump in the ice bath or whatever but but there is a bit of a process it's cool to hear that somebody else has a little bit of difficulty uh and it's not that. necessarily the it's not the subject matter that that wears me down or puts me in a dark place. It's it's the chaos and it's the um, any voice. I need I I absolutely need feedback. I need one or a very small select amount of people, very small amount of people to give me feedback on what they, an idea that I have or what they see in, a, in an edit. But when it gets any bit beyond a few, very small select few people giving me feedback, it fucks me up. When other people are like cutting scenes that I'm like, well, no, it should be like this, or we need the characters to be more lovable or blah, 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 or we need to blah, blah, blah. It, it fucks me up. Like it's, it's very difficult. Because cause I, coming from post, having experienced filming, having experienced edit, editing, having experience producing to some degree is a pro and a con. Um, I know too much and too little at the same point, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if that makes sense. No, it does. It, does for it, sure. it, it becomes very difficult. You're right. You're right. Um, what was it like? Is this is this the first project that you had um, doc project that you had like um, uh, a co director on? I don't think I saw one on the Amazing Jonathan in the credits, but maybe I, I missed that. Yeah, no, y yes, um, the uh, Kirk Johnson was 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 my right hand man on the Jonathan doc, and basically supplied the same the same services on the Jonathan doc and the Gladiators doc. Um, even though Kirk was there earlier on in the Gladiators doc, we we kind of boarded it out together ahead of filming, and he was he was always there. He was like the B cam operator. I would share interview questions with him, or he would like come up with like a first draft, and we would kind of do do some some of that stuff together. At the end of the day, 
you know, I think it is, you know, I, I am not, uh, there's a flaw, uh, potentially a pro, like my, my ability to collaborate is a unique ability, uh, and str and I struggle with it at times. Like, um, I, I think you watch the, the gladiator stock and you can see a lot of my identity in it. Kirk is a, is a big part of that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was absolutely great to have him on this project. Couldn't have done it without him due to the scale and the amount of people working on the project. Um, and yeah, he was able to absolutely provide, uh, some ideas that were like, oh, that unlocks, um, this, that unlocks this. Uh, so it was great. Um, how much producing did you guys do like bet between the two of you on um, on the project and, and as far as really managing talent and some of those types of things? Plenty. Too much. <laughs> too much. Um, yeah. Uh, it like um, in regards to managing the talent, managing like, you know, Saber, Malibu, Johnny, Dan Carr, you know, like we would kind of split up like Kirk had his people to like have relationships with and to, you know, whatever. I had my people, Vice, I made sure that, um, you know, Vice, there was a guy, Andrew Fresen at Vice, who was kind of Johnny's handler, which was super smart <laughs> to to do uh uh run that way um and then yeah on the day-to-day -day basis man it, it tires me to even think about it. it 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 makes me sad to to put my brain back to a year and a half ago we're in the office and it's uh, fuck all that shit <laughs> um but yeah no we did too much producing um picking up the slack for other people um and just on a day to day basis, we were the only two producers um, on a on a truly day to day basis. Uh, just too many people. Um, well, and you had a lot in, of, it in a healthy, smart way. There was a large element. Again, I don't want to be too spoilery, but you you had to do some chasing on the project, and there there were some there were some story threads that I, I assuming evolved. Um, and that's a real thing when you're doing docs, right? Yeah, especially like trying to get answers, seeking the truth. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what can I say about it? It's it's yeah, we we would find out something and then we would someone would tip us off to go interview someone else that would introduce us to this new person. And so it was it was this weird odyssey, this weird journey. Um, and how that correlates to like producing is, you know, trying to remain nimble enough and, 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 um, impro improvisational enough, uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of par for the course in, in docs like this, I suppose. Uh, was there ever a discussion about, um, and shoot, maybe you shot something and didn't use it. But um, with any of the um, original, like any of the commentators who in the early days were were a bunch of like really prominent retired NFL guys. Um, we we interviewed Mike Adamley, um, who was kind of the main host commentator of, of Gladiators, and he appears very, very um uh, in a, in a, in a kind of a, a, a small way in, in the project. Um, he actually, uh, I guess suffers from CTE, I guess from his football days, he used to be a football player, um, which was really, you know, he was, he was sharp and was able to, to, uh, speak eloquently and recall a lot of history, uh, of gladiators and all that. Um, and there were moments that were, that were pretty, um, visceral uh, of him trying to like 
recall something or communicate something. And it was, it was interesting, uh, but we weren't able to, or, or they didn't call to co- cover that in the dock necessarily. That's, that's part three in a few yeah. years. Um, and yeah, we reached out to Larry's Larry Zonka. We were, we had some communication with him, but we never landed that plane. And by the time, like we didn't need to, we thought, I wonder if he'll, I bet he'll appear in the um, Netflix one. So check yeah. that one. I bet he'll appear in that one. We also interviewed Lisa Malowski, who was brought in maybe in 1993 or so to be the co-host with Adam Lee. Um, and she was very thoughtful and, and really smart. And, uh, but um, yeah, to, to go into their pasts with a three hour, two part doc, oh, yeah. it was already packed with so much other stuff. Uh, as far and as I I'm just concerned. didn't know, I mean, you know, and again, that's maybe a great, again, example for, you know, if younger filmmakers are checking this stuff out, that's your, like your knee jerk reaction is a like, well, you got to have like Theismann and Todd Christensen and Zonka are the first people who are calling. But if you really look about what you're doing and you have to start to be efficient and stuff, right? You're like, okay, well, I'm, you know, they're wonderful people, but like, are they going to really give me anything for what we're you know, trying to you know, do. It's, it's, it's so interesting because, um, yeah, so some, you just have to trust your gut or, or, or almost the opposite of trust your gut. Uh, you'd be surprised. Like sometimes you just have to be like, I don't feel like that person is going to be additive or n- like have a big, like be absolutely necessary to this story or be able to like inform the actual story that we're, we're telling here. So let's actually maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze to actually interview Larry Zonka, but we could have interviewed Larry Zonka and he could have said something or introduced us to something that could have unlocked everything could have been the answer to, or, or set us off on a whole other course. Like I remember doing the teaser. I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I think if this is a lot of young filmmakers listening and I don't know what to do with this information, but to have this information. I remember like the day before interviewing, we, we, for the teaser, we interviewed Malibu or Saber and Malibu in one day. Cause they kind of live hardly close to each other. Um, and I was like, say, I didn't remember Saber from the show. I think I stopped watching American gladiators by the time he was on. And, um, I was like, okay, I looked him up on the internet. I was like, I don't know. This guy doesn't seem like he's going to be really, meaningful to this or is going to resonate with me and I don't remember him. So I was thinking of canceling him last minute, just maybe just doing Malibu, having a lighter day. And then something was like, uh, just fucking do it. Or it would be too much difficult, too difficult to like cancel him, whatever. So we go do it. And it was one of the, it was, it, it truly is the interview that connected so much for me. Cause he was like, he, I was introduced to the fact that he was very religious and he gave us this like I asked him for his favorite psalm and he gave us this psalm that was all about find the creator, seek the creator. It's important like it's less important that the that you know who the creator is. It's more important that the creator knows who you are. And it's it's truly like the th- I remember finishing that interview and like walking outside alone, talking to myself, being like, seek the fucking creator. You have to seek the creator. And he was talking about God, but like Dan Carr, the co-creator, we have to seek him. And it it did so much for me, like from my heart and from my brain and the plan of this doc that, and I was going to cancel him earlier that day or something. So when in doubt, do the fucking interview. How about that? Yeah, that's, that's, the, yeah, like, that's a great takeaway. And, and dude, to prove your point, Man, I almost never, like, I know it's still roughly f- fresh in my head, but like, you know, I watch so many docs because I, I love them, but like, it's very rare that a line of dialogue st- sticks with me. But like that immediate, I was like, oh shit, like that. And and where you guys used it as a button, I was like, oh my God, dude. Like that was, that was a great nugget of gold that you got there. Yeah, and and... It's moments like that where you're like, did we luck out or is there something more important going on here? 
<laughs> is there something guiding us a little bit? I, I rarely felt guided in a big uh, mystical or or like, you know, a cosmic way on the Gladiators doc. I absolutely felt that way with the Jonathan doc. Um, but there are those moments where you're like, OK, maybe this is all connected. <laughs> so that's good for movies. For sure. Well, dude, as as we look to wind this down, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, closer to the to the top, um, that you you may or may not be interested in Doc again. If you do, you're gonna, you're going to require you're going to retire potentially a couple of moves, if you will. But I wanted to see is is there anything um, you know on, on the horizon, Doc wise, that you want to talk about, or even something that you know you might be interested in? Um. Yes. Uh... Yeah, I've, I've been um, playing around with, I haven't for a little while because I've been trying to take a break and we just got the Gladiators doc out. But yeah, I've been approached about another uh, potential doc idea that I think me and the um, other producers will go f develop it a little bit and go film something. It takes place in, in Texas uh, based around a um, a small town that's that's like kind of got the most maximum security prisons and do the most ex public or the uh, public uh, executions in the in the state, if not in the or in the country, if not in the world. Um, so a doc kind of centered around that. But it would be funny. And uh, maybe, I was going to say, what's a doc like that subject matter through your lens look like, man? That's sign me up, right? If I'm HBO Max or Max or fucking Amazon yeah, whatever or whatever, I'm like, out. Yeah. Ben Berman doing a death doc, prison death doc. Sign me up. Here's yeah. millions of dollars. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I can kind of see it, but but what I see is not the reality. So we would have to just hit the ground in Texas and 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 see what what's really there. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm attracted to. Um, very large scale. I, I thought the other day, what, what would it be like? Is there something interesting to doing the smallest doc possible about the biggest subject possible or vice versa, doing the biggest documentary possible about the smallest yeah. subject matter? Like those two parallels or those two, whatever, interest me. Yeah, um, I like I like the second because you're you're starting to maybe get into again. I know it's a scripted reference, but some like waiting for Guffman type of territory of like a giant grandiose about something that's very tiny. Mm -hmm. um, there's something interesting about. There's something no, interesting about either of those. Bigger, things. like I don't even know. Like I don't know. I was watching this Imagineering documentary on Disney Plus, and I kind of started to fall in love with it. Partially because the scale and scope of the Disney Corporation is incredibly big. And even just going to a park, which I haven't, I've been to Disney World when I was a young boy, but like Disney World, Disneyland, you know, there are these full, the, the scope and scale of these fully immersive worlds are, are bizarrely impressive. Like they build like, um, huge mountains for like the cars exhibit, I guess, which is in Anaheim, I think, yeah. uh, where you can drive a, one of the cartoon cars around or whatever, but you're like in the desert. And, and I think 360, wherever you look, you can't like, you're just in that world. Like there's telephone poles and a highway on the other side, but you can't see it. I don't know. I, I don't know. My, my point is, is that I'm, I'm starting to get interested in, what is the biggest, grandest scope? What is what is a very large scope of a thing? But doing having a, the documentary approach being very small, very being very intimate with the biggest thing or cosmos or whatever space yeah. travel. Do a fucking really small one man band camera. I'm doing sound camera on yeah. on the trip to Mars or something or do the biggest documentary that's millions of dollars on like an one ant, <laughs> you know? What was your typical crew size? Sorry to go back with one. I was yeah. trying to see in some of this, were you guys running maybe maybe three people, four people at, a, at an interview set or how big was your, your crew on most of the interviews? 
Oh, for interviews, we 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 had a good question. We had Dan Adlerstein, the DP, great DP, close friend. Uh, Kirk Johnson, B camera, um, uh, and and doing other things, of course. Uh, Gaffer, Will Elder, often, but we traded him, or you know, he wasn't always available. Uh, a grip, probably. I don't know. Like when we traveled, when we traveled to like Erie, it was very small. There was no extra grip or gaffer like Dan would set up his own lighting. We would all like to do a small interview that truly completely don't tell anyone this, but like it looks the same as like when we had four additional people. Right. <laughs> um, that would be one to a sound person and Danny Ryan, the A.E.D.I.T. So the very, very small. A very very small overall. Then when we did our recreations, we had a whole. We hired up, you know. We, we sure got our sure. Whole, yeah. Uh, um, well, dude, super super fun. Two two great pieces. Uh, one great piece cut in half. However you want to. Um, but yeah, definitely if everybody go check out um, the American Gladiators documentaries part one and part two. It's fantastic. Definitely haven't seen anything like that. Uh, in the doc space, it's on ESPN Plus, which is maybe through your Hulu. Like, dude, seriously, that was the biggest pain in the ass. Was actually trying to figure out like the route of apps to like I can't did, watch well, it on ES. Big question is: Did you did you have to purchase a new? Did you have to get a new subscription to something in order to watch this, or did you already have your bundle? I already of- had ESPN Plus, but I think you right. would have to to actually. Um, it's weird the way, like, cause it comes through Hulu, but you also have to, it, it, it was a bit of a, uh, I think it's actually fairly simple. I only had Hulu and then just recently, cause this was going to be on ESPN plus and all that. I bought the Hulu or the Disney bundle. So now I have Hulu, Disney plus and yes. ESPN plus, and you're right. I can go right to ESPN plus and watch it. Uh, or any 30 for 30 or anything ESPN's ever done. Uh, I think I could also find the American Gladiators doc on Hulu, which is cool because that's the home of the Amazing Jonathan documentary. So there's some right. energy there. Um, it's not on Disney Plus, and I don't know if it ever will be. They do have some 30 for 30s on Disney Plus. But I also know if you don't have any of these things, you can go to Amazon and purchase uh, each part. Um, oh, for like ninety nine, so that's that's the thing that I'm almost most happy with. Yeah, of course the Disney bundle and ESPN Plus is great, no question about it. But if you don't have it, it's a simple Amazon purchase or rental, and then you're there. Thanks for talking. Fantastic man. watches. Yeah, Ben, dude, thanks thanks for coming on. Um, everybody, Appreciate thanks for listening. If you haven't already subscribed, uh, and we'll be back next month.